I'm Pedro da Costa, and it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Thomas Honig. Tom spent all of 38 years, I believe, at the Federal Reserve in a very long and uh, distinguished career. And I got to know him during a little bit before, actually, and during the 2008 financial crisis uh, in his role as Kansas City Fed chair, where he was instrumental in making a lot of the decisions about you know, how to deal with that crisis. Uh, and uh, subsequently, he went to the FDIC, where he was vice chair there. And uh, he is now a distinguished fellow at George Mason University's Mercatus Center. So thank you so much for joining me, Tom. I really appreciate it. It's good to, good to join you this morning. Thank you. Good to see you again. Uh, it's my pleasure. I wanted to start by asking you what I've been asking everybody. First of all, is how are you doing in this pandemic? How has physical distancing affected your life? And is are you and everybody in your family okay? Uh, at, yes, fortunately, we're all okay. Uh, the the distance seen and the isolation is, like I think for most people, beginning to wear on us since uh, we have family not very far away and we can't get together with them. But that's a small price to pay for health, so we're we're happy to do it until this thing passes. Absolutely, yeah. I feel like we're you know I was looking at the stats and we're we're in a blessed minority that can accomplish our work remotely in the first place. So yeah. uh, you know, very good point. Yeah, very so, good point. Um, you know, I wanted to ask you. We, we seem to get mixed messages from the Fed as far as the economy itself and the strength of the financial system. I, I understand that this is a special, you know, this is a, a very significant shock that is external that we're going through. But at the same time, the Fed keeps coming up with a new, it's, you know, I'm a, I'm a Fed reporter who pays close attention to this stuff. I can't keep up with all the emergency facilities that keep, seem to be cropping up on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Was the financial system truly healthy going into this crisis? Well, the only way I can answer that is to say that it is certainly was healthier going into this crisis than it was the last crisis. Um, it has more capital. Uh, it's not as healthy as it might have been uh, because uh, I think the industry could have um, benefited from more capital, which would give them greater staying power and greater flexibility. But relatively speaking, it is, uh, I think, better positioned to weather this if it doesn't go on indefinitely. What do you make of the Fed's response thus far? I mean, again, we've revived some of the old uh, facilities that you were right there for their their original creation. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the same policies in terms of launching QE, if in a slightly different form. But we're also going beyond... Uh, you know, the scope of measures <clears throat> undertaken in 2008. Uh, what do you make of this uh, alphabet soup of facilities, but also the monetary action? Well, I think that the basically the tool is the same, right? The printing of money, uh, the creation of money to fund whatever is needed. And given the nature of this crisis uh, being started from a natural disaster that seems to be uh, ongoing, I'm not sure that the Fed had any choice. So as different sectors have become uh, uh, under stress and needing some kind of, uh, of financial liquidity support, the Fed has felt compelled. And I think the public agrees with that at this point, that it, it had to step in in any way it could. And that's why you're seeing it, it the old tools merely being expanded to a greater number of uh, participants uh, in this, uh, shall we call it, a liquidity prov provisioning going forward. Yeah. And could we talk a little bit about some of the specific measures? So the market's very interested in the corporate bond buying aspect to it of the of the program because it is new and because the U.S. corporate bond market is so large. I'm wondering. Uh, so two things: you, as a, as a FOMC member, you are always cautious even about potential credit distortions in terms of the Fed's interventions into the mortgage market. Mm -hmm. This, of course, takes us far, uh, way further down the rabbit hole of, yeah. of credit uh, allocation. <clears throat> and two, I wonder how you uh, how you expect the Fed to construct such a program in the way that uh, that makes it fairly neutral and that shields it from uh, kind of political criticism of favoring one corporate sector over another. Well, I think to begin with, the, the, because the, the banking industry is 
itself a levered industry. Uh, you would, in, you know, ideally you would want them to provide the liquidity into the corporate world. And they are, given the size of this crisis, they are uh, unable and uh, to do so, especially given their own current leverage positions, which are better than they were, but not as strong as they might have been. So that does leave it to the central bank, who can, in fact, create the necessary liquidity to fund. And and they felt compelled. And uh, if during the crisis, uh, I can understand that. In fact, I supported uh, intervention in the during the last crisis. The difficult is that you are setting a precedent, and uh, it makes you subject to greater political uh, pressure in the future for whatever crisis comes along. And that is the unfortunate part of this. And whether they can withdraw themselves from this in a way that says, whoops, that was a one-time, very special pandemic created, and we're not doing that for um, just any panic uh, that comes about. That will be very difficult, but I think necessary, and something for the Fed to be thinking about, not not now, but very soon as the current crisis uh, recedes, they'll have some major challenges. But they, I hope they do it. Otherwise, they will become subject to greater and greater political pressure. Does the fact that uh, I've heard an interesting point, I, mean, I, I spoke to Randy Krosner, your former colleague recently, he made the interesting point that uh, while the Fed feared the loss of uh, direct 13-3 emergency lending powers, uh, after Dodd-Frank and the need to go to Treasury for approval, that this approval actually enhanced the political backing and cover that the Fed now has. What do you make of that view? And does that give the Fed more leeway to intervene in corporate bond markets and, and muni bonds in a way that it, it was maybe not able to do when you were there? Well, I think that's 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 a one good way of looking at it. I think uh, I always had the feeling that uh, having to go to the Treasury was hardly a handicap. Your, your greatest difficulty is resisting the Treasury because it's the political entity. And that's a challenge. I mean, the Fed's independence is less than it was uh, because of that and because of other actions it's taken in the past. So I wonder what memories about the last crisis does this bring up for you? And, uh, and how do you see this as a different phenomenon? Because obviously this is, uh, we're talking about whether or not it's man-made, I guess, if, if the pandemic is in any way linked to climate change, which it might be, maybe it's man-made, but it's not quite as man-made as subprime mortgages, right? Right, right. It, it's different in the sense of the source of the, the immediate source, the trigger source for this crisis is quite a bit different. And therefore, that, that puts everyone in the position. Both parties are in that position, the Fed's in that position, the administration that, that you, yes, this was not anyone's fault except this pandemic, and therefore we have to do all we can, that gives them a lot of leeway. Uh, but the, the downside of that is it also sets precedent for the future, which will be um, more difficult to manage, I suspect, going forward. So very similar to the last crisis in terms of the need to do something uh, broader than the last crisis in the scope of what uh, they're willing and able to do. and more acceptance by the public and the politicians that they do it. And I, the reason I ask you is, I guess, as a reporter, as a much younger reporter back then, uh, I covered the crisis. And of course, we, when we were living it that closely, I assume you felt the same way. We're like, this is as bad as sort of things can get, right? Yeah. And, and of course, now we're living through a public health crisis that seems much more severe. But I wonder if you have any recollections of like what the, what the phone calls were for emergency measures, like the, the kind of how those things came about. Give us a peek into kind of how the how the Fed and, and global central banks were able to rally behind the scenes to, to, to act in fairly coordinated and aggressive fashions. Well, I think the, the I think the methods then are the same today. Uh, I, I wasn't in the meetings today, but I suspect they're the same. But basically you have um, the, the, the chairman and his folks, uh, the staff around him and his colleagues, um, talking to different central banks. Uh, then there are many, many phone calls and video conferences yeah. where the chairman and the FOMC members would gather and uh, they would discuss you know, what to do. Here's, our, here's what we're thinking we can do. Let's see about doing this. 
And there would be a discussion around that. And I think in that period, there was probably more um, give and take uh, in the sense that, are you sure this is right? What are we doing? I wonder if we should do this much. There's more hesitancy. What I would guess this time, uh, and if I were sitting in that room, I would have been much more willing to say, all right, let's do it. Uh, we have to do it because of the nature. So there's a the same the same mechanism is in place, I'm sure. Uh, the discussions are more uh, one way uh, yeah. than they were back then. And I think yeah. that's probably an important difference. That makes sense. One of the other differences that strikes me is that as much as financial authorities have been quick and aggressive, both on the uh, on the monetary and also the fiscal side, you, you know, it's kind of surprising considering how long it took to get a bill last time. Mm -hmm. This was a pretty uh, Herculean and, and rapid effort to get this $2 trillion out the door. At least initially, we know there are hiccups. Um, so I wonder how much of that was but the, but the thing that I find also is that you can't really put a financial floor on a health crisis, and therefore, you kind of can't find the bottom until you find the bottom on the health side, and, and the financial authorities are helpless on that end. Can you speak yeah. to that a little bit? Well, I think I'm not from you mean in terms of the fiscal support that that's being. Yeah, the, the fall, I guess I'm looking at it the following sense. You said the Fed can do this as long as it doesn't last too long, right? but we don't know how long it's going to last, yeah. and it's not like the Fed. The Fed's actions can be a determinant of how long it's going to last. Yeah. It's really up to the health patterns yeah. that are sort of out of everyone's control. Yeah. That seems to well, be a more difficult animal to, uh, you know, to cage. Yeah. Well, I think here's how, here's how I would approach that. I would tell you, first of all, um, the Fed can do what they're doing. They can print money as long as it takes uh, and I think they're willing to do that. that the, the difficulty is that if this pandemic and the health crisis, the longer it lasts, the worse the economy gets. Yeah. Uh, and I suspect, though, that what you're going to see, you saw this very quick response on the fiscal side. Uh, the Fed will support that by keeping interest rates low so to find that. And I think there's already discussions underway. Not think. I know there's discussions underway for another fiscal uh, stimulus package to help uh, small businesses to help unemployed and so forth. And the Federal Reserve will support that. I, I don't think there's any question. And they'll do that in the sense of keeping interest rates very low. And they will, uh, if the government has to issue this debt to do it, they will be the ultimate buyer of that debt to make sure it is, uh, it is uh, they are able to get the cash they need to spend this money at low interest rates. And I think that is what we will see uh, until this now, the more difficult part will be the timing of the exit, because you can't just pull it back. And uh, so you'll have that. And then how you uh, avoid having precedents sent that are so, um, uh, so, in, so entrenched that you can't pull out at all. So yeah. there are many challenges currently, which the Fed and the governments are going to face without any reservation. But then the hard ones come down the road, and that'll be uh, difficult period for us as well. So uh, I know forecasting is a fool's errand even in good times. And right now it's just kind of the uncertainty levels are off the charts. But in terms of the how likely and how I mean, how big the Fed's balance sheet is likely to get, um, what kind of number would you put on that in terms of the fiscal expansion that might be needed under different scenarios, say, if, we, if this lasts three months versus six months, uh, how, how far could we go? Well, I think, first of all, remember that there was a trend for greater fiscal spending even before this occurred. And in, I think, 2010 period, there was about $11 trillion of debt. Last year, there was $22 trillion of debt. Uh, and I suspect with what's going on now, we'll have $24 trillion of debt. And then before, depending on how long this lasts, it could be as high as $28 trillion of debt or more. And I think the Fed's balance sheet, which back then was, you know, a trillion dollars to round it up, uh, was uh, four and a half trillion in 2015. It came down a little. It's now six trillion. Uh, I would not be surprised at all to see the the, the balance sheet uh, grow to ten trillion dollars over the next two to two years or so. It it will be very dramatic because even after the pandemic. You have to get through the recovery, and that will put enormous pressure on the Federal Reserve to make sure that interest rates remain low, both for the government to borrow 
and for um, uh, the, the economy itself to recover. So it's going to be uh, under a lot of pressure to ex uh, uh, increase its, its uh, printing of money, its creation of reserves, and I could see it being $10 trillion uh, fairly easily see that coming our way. So it doesn't sound like you think we're ha we're headed for a V-shaped recovery. I mean, because this seems like a, something that's going to have a fairly, you know, severe, at least short-term impact on the economy. I, I I hope it's a V-shaped recovery. I don't expect it to be because of the uh, what I'm what I'm hearing and what I'm when I talk to people in the energy industry, which is under pressure to begin with, but now is really under pressure. The um, uh, hospitality industry is really under deep pressure. Small businesses, so that you know, those aren't easy just to bounce back. Yeah. It takes time, and I think even the even the recovery for the pandemic itself will be uh, stepwise. So yeah. I think it's going to be a, a slow. I hope not overly difficult recovery, but a slower recovery than people would like. Certainly, uh, slower than I would like. I mean, seeing watching some of the reporting out of Wuhan as to how gradual the reopening is is fairly sobering. I, I saw one reporter based out there talking about how he has a he has a two hour daily freedom pass to go out. Mm. Um, I, so, I I, I hope know. we don't come to that, but I do. I I think people will be cautious. I hope they're cautious because yeah. if you have a repeat, then things will be so much worse. So I yeah. think it's going to be a difficult recovery. Uh, and, for no, and in that context, do you have a sense of, have you been thinking about long-term patterns and changes in the economy that might emerge from this, uh, you know, from this, you know, we're, we're, we're having this, we would have been sitting down having this conversation in the studio probably, but now we're doing it remotely. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of teleworking going on and attempts to even make teleworkable work that was previously only doable in person. Uh, what long-term changes have you been thinking about and, and reading about that, that yeah. might so actually? One, ben Bernanke mentioned yesterday during uh, his Brookings uh, Zoom conference, <laughs> apropos, <laughs> he, that he, you know, he thought there might be a sort of depression-like effect where people be, remain more cautious and more, you know, a greater propensity to save, and after a time of, you know, extreme distress. Yeah. I think um, that's certainly possible. I, my own view is that um, I find through many crises now <laughs> that people rebound more quickly than we ever anticipate they will. And I think what what this is doing is it will accelerate certain trends like uh, home officing, perhaps uh, that was already underway. Other kinds of uh, advantages that technology has brought, I think those will accelerate. I think we will also see um, a continued acceleration in some of the uh, consolidation that's going on in the in the economy and the use of remote uh, access like Amazon services and so forth. So I think those are already in play and those will accelerate forward. I think one thing that will happen uh, is happening and will uh, will be hard to uh, reverse is the role of government. Uh, yeah. In, in business. This is yeah. going to be, this is a big step of government. Each of these programs uh, in the in the relief bill has a leash to them. There's, yeah. here's the money, here's the, here's the conditions. Yeah. And to withdraw from that, I think will be hard. So we'll see more of government uh, into the system. But I do think overall, the economy will uh, at first slowly come back, uh, but then we'll uh, regain its footing as we move through 2021, uh, hopefully uh, with as little uh, fallout as possible. Do you have a sense of how deep the, GD the GDP hit could be and how high unemployment could get in this phase? Well, I've seen lots of estimates. Uh, I think I don't think 15% is uh, unreasonable at all. It could be higher than that uh, if this does extend through the first part of the summer. Uh, but I uh, so I'm thinking 15 percent unemployment, maybe 20 percent, and then the GDP will fall, you know, at least five percent, uh, yeah. and could be greater than that. But you know, I have a crystal ball in my office. It so far has served me poorly, uh, and so I won't rely on that. I'll just I just know we have to be prepared for an extended uh, tough recovery. But once it gets going. I'm more hopeful that it'll come back fairly quickly. 
Sounds good. Well, I have my crystal ball is cracked and on the ground, so I'm not even looking at it. Um, I like to use the the magic eight ball for answers uh, myself. Absolutely. <laughs> my daughter has one of those. So now I'm going to jump into the more lighthearted portion of our of our conversation called the intersection, where I'll ask a series of uh, slightly more personal questions that we ask all of our guests. So thank you sure. for indulging us here. I'm happy to. Uh, the first one is is uh, whether there's any person dead or alive that you'd like to interview have a sit down with, uh, be on the other end of the camera here, I guess, at, at the moment. Well, I am, uh, yeah, I'm a, uh, um, admirer of Paul Volcker and Alan Melcher, both of them. I would love to talk with them because who else could help us think about this, uh, current pandemic and crisis better than they would. Uh, I would love to get their, uh, their wisdom at this point. And unfortunately they've, uh, recently passed and can't do that, but they were real heroes of mine. Yeah. Uh, uh, I will tell you also, uh, being from Kansas City area, uh, I would love to talk with Harry Truman, who uh, had his own crises to deal with and a great man of integrity also. That's great. Okay, so next, what are what is the book or books that have changed your view of the world and, uh, and what are you reading right now? Well, uh, books have changed my thinking of the world have been um, when I was younger, uh, I did uh, begin to read uh, 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 Hayek's re uh, work and became much more impressed with how he thought about decentralized systems and how they work. Um, and I have found that very worthwhile. Uh, more recently, I read a book uh, in, entitled The Wright Brothers, uh, which I found inspiring, uh, even for today, because here are these bicycle uh, manufacturers and they they invent this airplane and uh, how they went about it uh, gives me great hope for the future in this world of technology. So it was, I just finished it not too long ago. It was just a tremendous book. I recommend it to you, everyone. That's great. I'll check it out. Uh, so as an individual or a leader in your field, how do you remain engaged and relevant uh, in a fast moving world. And now, especially now that you've left public life officially, how, to, how is that going? Well, it's, uh, I'm enjoying it. Um, I, I'm associated with Mercatus, which is uh, a, an opportunity to uh, interact and engage with uh, academics and other policy individuals frequently. And that's of tremendous value to me. Uh, under this isolation environment, I, I do make it a point to I read everything I can in the morning early. Uh, to kind of catch up on how quickly things are changing. Then I, I, I talk to my colleagues a great deal, sometimes like video, other times one-on-one -on, -one on the phone uh, to get kind of get the detail, the sense of things. And then I try and write because the discipline of that has you get, get your thinking out of the chaos mode into a more disciplined uh, pan, uh, projection, I'll say. So that's uh, that's kind of it, and it's I'm enjoying it. Uh, I don't enjoy the isolation, but I do enjoy yeah. the interaction with people and and staying engaged as I yeah. can do. No, I actually like as much as semantics might might be meaningless at times. I think it was an important distinction they've made recently to talk about physical rather than social distancing, because in a way we've I've become more social and caught up with different people in different ways now yeah. that we're stuck. At yeah, I, I'm spending a lot of time on the phone talking to friends and, and colleagues and so forth. And it's it's uh, it's very I enjoy it a great deal. It, uh, in fact, it makes the days pass a little faster than I anticipated. <laughs> it does. It does. And it, it and it focuses whatever research questions you're focused on or in my reporting really helps you Absolutely. figure out what's next. So that's great. So some of our guests can tie their professional success to a single key breakthrough or a meeting they had or a person that gave them a lift. Is there such a, a moment in your career that you can uh, think back to? Well, I first of all, I would say that I've been very fortunate in my career because I've had wonderful mentors who have helped guide me all the way from grad school through uh, my, my role as president of the bank. Uh, I would suspect um, that, you know, out, out of crisis comes opportunity. And uh, one of the crises that took place in the early 80s uh, was the oil crisis of that period, which affected our region. And I was a, a, a young uh, officer uh, at that time in the bank of uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City and got very much involved in dealing with that crisis. And what's given 
more responsibility than I might have otherwise been given. And I think that did help put me forward as someone to think about uh, for the future at the bank. And it served me very well. Unfortunate as those circumstances were, and as much as I would have not liked to have had the crisis evolve, it, it was a, a probably a boost to my career. That's great. Can you identify a failure? I like to talk, talk about it more as a set, potential setback yeah. that you had to overcome that was significant to you. Well, uh, I can't. I mean, I've had, believe me, I've had my share of setbacks over time that I've learned from. That's the idea of it. Uh, I, I, I have had in my career uh, analytical, um, shall we say, uh, incorrect uh, th thoughts that were completely wrong and that I had put forward that people kindly forgave me for. Uh, but those were those were those were cloudy days, as a friend of mine used to say. But I did get through them and learn from them, and that's the the benefit of it. So I'll put it that way. Great. And last one. Uh, what view do you hold professionally that you would say is most controversial? Well, um, I was, let me begin by saying in the last crisis, I was supportive of the immediate relief programs uh, in 2008. Uh, I became very um, strongly in disagreement with the majority of the FOMC when they initiated QE one and two and so forth in a recovering economy. So they were putting massive amounts of reserves into the system in a recovery, keeping interest rates low. And I was concerned then uh, that it was going to create the next um, uh, excess with uh, increased leverage, misallocation of resources that would follow from that. And I, that was very controversial at the time inside the Fed. Uh, I still feel very comfortable with my position. Nothing's changed. If anything, in my mind, it's been confirmed. We are more leveraged today than we would have otherwise been, and that has not served us well in this pandemic crisis itself. Uh, it's not the cause of the crisis. That, that is, the leverage isn't the cause, but it makes dealing with it more difficult than I think it otherwise would have been. Very controversial view in, the, in its time, but I feel very comfortable with it. I, I do remember the controversy. Thank you so <laughs> much for joining me, Tom. I really appreciate it. That was Thomas Honig. He's a distinguished fellow at the Mercator Center at George Mason University, and he's the former president of the Kansas City Federal Reserve. Thank you so much again. Thank you also. If you're ready to go beyond the interview, make sure you visit realvision.com where you can try Real Vision Plus for 30 days for just $1. We'll see you next time right here on Real Vision.